On this episode of Low Buck Garage, I check hydraulic oil, I check transmission oil, I check out the final drives. The best quick release nut I've ever seen. And then this happens. Previously on Low Buck Garage, I bought this Nissan diesel swapped Oliver loader to distract me from projects that weren't going well. They're going better now. This Jeep transmission is ready to install with less rust and a lower ratio first gear. New metal's in and the bus is getting a proper paint job. This project is coming along nicely, but I kept thinking about that loader. The hydraulics bothered me. When I first got it running, the hydraulics sounded fine for a few minutes. They got a little noisy, and then a bit worse. The fluid looks somewhat questionable, so I figured changing the fluid and the filters was probably a good first step. I didn't have any luck coming up with the numbers on these. These are an inline filter housing that's pretty universal. If I find something that matches that, I should be good. Found a drain plug on the tank. Let's let that run for a while. There's also a filter on the return line, so I figure this will be a good starting point. I could look that up and buy one in town. Now one good thing about Wix is they have a good website for figuring out stuff about the filters. This gave me the information knowing that the thread was actually the same and the gasket was the same diameter. Also, it's a 10 micron filter, which wasn't good. Now this is the suction line that goes to the tank down through that big red hose to the hydraulic pump. You want as much fluid as possible going there. You really don't want restriction. While I was looking at the Wix page for this one, I saw a footnote on the bottom saying the same filters available in different mesh sizes. This is a 51553. Also was in stock at my local parts store. And this is a 33 micron filter, but they have three different mesh sizes in the same filter housing. I might need to know that in the future. We can pop this one on here with the big mesh size. Then on the return line that's under some pressure, we'll put the other one, that's the 10 micron one. Had to buy a new jug of hydraulic oil. And the hydraulics were nice and quiet again. After that, I figured to check all the other fluids, like the transaxle. The oil wasn't supposed to be up that high, and it was supposed to look like oil. Looks like we're draining this transaxle. Pulling out the transmission drain plug. This should be interesting. Oh, there's water. Oh yeah, lots of water. This did not look good. So we gotta time it to see how long it took to drain out. It's kind of neat seeing the different ways that the water and the sludge flowed. I may have spent way too much time just looking at this and thinking about it. It's probably a good thing that after 16 minutes my camera battery finally died. My camera battery went dead about an hour ago. Let's see how it's doing. We still have it oozing out. I let it sit overnight. I need to take off the back cover of the transaxle. So here I just unbolt this hitch assembly and move it out of the way so I can get in there. I'm not sure if I'm actually making my life easier. Well, I could put the wrench on it, but that's in the way of turning it. Maybe if I come from under, I can't get the box end on there. Oh, that might do it. Let's see if foot power will work. There we go. Toe power. These are a lot easier to get to. Let's just drag the machine forward. Looks like that'll free everything up. Still got 
got a ton of slack on those hoses. They seem a little bit too long. I ended up taking up all the hydraulics too. It didn't seem like the hoses were particularly good and it made life a lot easier. A bit of old grease and dirt build up. We're gonna see if an old wood chisel will do the trick. Oh yeah, that's removing grease nicely. Wonder what else I'll find in here. I think I can see all the bolts now. Apparently someone didn't have short enough bolts, so they made the regular bolt shorter. I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to say something like big transmission reveal at 10 million subs or something, but I got too much actual work to do for that. Let's just get this thing out of there. Come on, there we are. There's a crack in the brake band right there. That's not a good start. I'm sure none of that brown stuff is rust. We got our brakes, we got our differential, we've got goop, we got a lot of cleanup to do. This is pretty goopy. I'm glad I brought the manual, because that told me that this one gearbox has two drain plugs on it. Would have never known to look for a second one. Oh yeah, that's more goop. It's like a soft serve machine. It's the most horrible smelling soft serve you've ever seen in your life. Or smelled. Or experienced in any way. These brake linings look really good. I'm quite surprised. They're supposed to be a quarter inch thick. I'm measuring 225. They're barely worn at all. So these are going right back in. And we're just going to get them adjusted up. And speaking of adjusters, i got to correct something. Now last time when I talked about the brakes on this, I got it backwards. I thought these brake arms had been flipped around. I'm used to brake adjusters like this, where the curved bit on the nut is actually a locking feature, and you turn it into position, and it keeps it from rotating and getting out of adjustment. And I thought this worked the same way, where that feature in the nut would fit in to that feature on the arm and lock it in place. That's not how it works. This is actually for letting it pivot. And this side here is a relief. So that way the arm can go in and pivot around and this whole thing can move freely. Everything here in the braking system is actually looking pretty good. The pivot pin looks mostly okay, except for the part that's missing. Might need to replace that. I think a high strength bolt will be just fine. I even got a self-locking nut for it. Fortunately, in order to install that bolt, I have to take off this entire lever. And that's a good thing, because I never would have greased that otherwise. Now this is a brake band I saw that had issues. Looks like it cracked right through two of the rivet holes. Someone welded on a reinforcing plate to cover up that, which then cracked by another rivet hole. So I'm gonna finish welding up this reinforcement plate and weld that initial crack and hopefully this holds together. Perfect. Got the inside crack welded. I'm gonna grind that down to make sure it doesn't hit the drum. I finished off on that patch where it should have gone around in the first place. We're better than we were. I can't really get in there to clean it any better than this, and I know there's a lot of that goo in there. I found an old tractor forum post that had a homebrew for cleaning out sludge. It looked great. So I'm gonna put the cover back on and pour in a secret magic elixir that's going to just clean all that stuff out. We can flush it away without having to physically get it out of there. It's time to fill up this transaxle. We're going to add the secret goop. First ingredient is two quarts of diesel fuel. Now this is going to soften up all that goop and make it flow. And there's two quarts. And next is a quart of high strength isopropyl alcohol. This one's 91%. This is the highest I could find easy. Now this should dissolve that remaining water and put it in solution with the oil so it can actually flush out. Next, we add a quart of automatic transmission fluid. And the ATF is good at suspending particles. It's made to hold bits of clutch material in suspension in the oil, so any loose debris in there hopefully will get trapped in the ATF. Now at the end, we top it off with the actual gear oil. Now this thing's supposed to hold two gallons total, 
So with all the stuff I already added, I should be able to put one gallon of this stuff in. Now somewhere under all this caked on grease, there should be a fill plug for this final drive unit. Got the fill plugs out of these final drives. The good news is I don't see any sign of water. I do see black gook with metal flakes in it. That is less good than I'd like. But since I don't see water, I'm not gonna bother draining it for now. I'm just gonna fill it up to the top. The plug is a standard pipe plug. So I made up some pipe fittings, made myself a temporary filler neck. It's going in very slowly. So I'm just gonna come back and pour some in every once in a while until it stays level. So in the meantime, I'm gonna get a few other things done. I got a comment in my last video about taking off these dust covers. Apparently the bolts that hold this drive sprocket on have a habit of coming loose. So it's one of those things you want to check and make sure they're tight. Ooh. I noticed this turns. This nut doesn't actually attach anything. Now this nut holds together all the bearings on the rear sprocket and drive. It's kind of important. The best quick release nut I've ever seen. That just comes right off. I figured I'd check the other side too. That doesn't seem very secure. This one doesn't fall off, but it clearly is not attached. Oh, this is interesting. It appears this one is held in with a bolt that's been turned into a rivet. That is quality craftsmanship right there. Hmm. I think we're gonna have to do something about that. I bought replacement nuts. What these are are self-locking nuts. And they work in two different ways. This one, it's a regular nut, and then they have three spots where they squish the thread down. I don't know if you can see it in there, it's just distorted. And that locks this nut in the thread and keeps it from turning. I don't think this is gonna help me. This one, they cut slits in the end of it and squeeze the whole end smaller. This end of the nut, we're looking at being about 935 on the inside. Go to this end, we're under 910. So this end of the nut is significantly smaller. That might actually grip the threads I have. That one's already getting tight. That feels pretty good. Now this one is mostly a normal thread and that's loose and sloppy. When I get to those deformed features, it does lock down and tighten up a little bit. But that's only going to be gripping on three spots. I don't think that's going to be strong enough. This one, on the other hand, is going to be gripping all the way around. It's time to see if the self-locking nut will do the trick. It's actually moved it in quite a bit, so that's a good sign. Well, I definitely have some torque on it. I don't want to crank it too much, but looks like that's on there. And it's a self-locking nut, so hopefully it won't come loose. I'll be keeping an eye on that one though. I almost forgot that the whole point of doing this was to check these studs. They're definitely not loose. Now I've got to deal with getting a nut on this side. And as bad as the other threads were, these look worse. I gotta take some weight off this thing. Huh, threads are mangled the whole length. At least it's consistent. It's now this is a tool I borrowed from my buddy Skipper. It's got replaceable dies with different thread pitches cut into the side of them, all different ones. Right there is the pitch I need. And by turning the end here, you can adjust your pitch diameter. It's apparently meant for things that are really, really big. I ran out of travel in this tool, tightening the cutter into the threads. So I took the old nut, cut it in half, and that way it'll ride in the threads and not damage them. Like a pipe cutter, I can tighten this down and make my pitch diameter smaller. And you see that, I'm making chips. So we are getting these threads deeper. I've made some improvement on the threads, but it's still pretty terrible. Back here, the threads get a little bit better. I'm gonna to try to get the nut to push on a little further. This piece looks pretty hefty. I think I can trim just a little bit off the end, get that nut to go on a little further, I might be getting somewhere here. Now this is gonna be easy to cross thread, so I'm using this as a guide to hold the nut square as I thread it on. Hmm. 
moving. Okay, we got torque on this. That nut is tightened down. I'm noticing I got this nut past where that squished bolt was. I'm gonna put that in too. Maybe I won't put this exact one in, but I think I'll put something in right through that hole since it's already drilled there as a safety so this can't pop loose. That might be better. Oh yeah, perfect. Now those threads are completely mutilated, which makes a handy self-locking feature. Let's put the nut right on that. Now I'm sure those torn up threads on this nut are not strong enough. I'm sure that bolt is not strong enough. But between the two, they might become strong enough to hold this together. We're just gonna pop this together and pretend everything's gonna be fine. That was pretty close to full already. Nice, something's going right. Shouldn't say that out loud. There's supposed to be a button head grease fitting there. Let's see if one appears. Found it. Now I gotta get lube into those bottom rollers through these button head fittings. I got a button head fitting adapter that goes on a grease gun. Problem is, I'm not supposed to put grease in there. I'm supposed to use the same 98 GL1 gear oil that goes into the transmission. Because apparently there's rollers and things and grease doesn't actually circulate properly. They actually destroy these if you grease them because you can't get the lubrication rolling around where it's supposed to go. So I gotta get this stuff in here. I'm not sure if this grease gun is gonna work, but this is a suction type, which means not only can it do the cartridges, but you can also put it into a vat of grease, pull the piston, and it'll actually suck out the grease and load itself, which means there's a rubber seal in here. And I'm hoping that rubber seal will hold that oil in. All right, we're full of gear oil. I don't see any leaking at the bottom, so that's a good start. Let's attempt installing oil into the, oh, it's dripping. Let's just ignore that. Yo, we are pumping something. I pumped them until oil started oozing out the roller, so hopefully we're in better shape. Figure while I'm at it, better check the oil on this reduction transmission. Not getting anything on my finger. All right, we're gonna top that off. I've got gear lube in on and around everything in a 10 foot radius this machine. I figure about 10% of it actually went into the bearings and stuff it needs to go into. So it's probably good. We're gonna fire it up and slosh that stuff around in the transaxle and then see what it looks like when it comes out. When it's dark, it's easy to find a bad connection. I'm gonna fix that. I had to wait for daylight to actually do the fixing on this. As usual, loaders are never convenient to work on. Give it a little shot of go juice. It's cold. T-shirt cold. Let it warm up for a few. The steering brakes were definitely working much better than before. I did a few top gear, high speed runs to really mix that juice around in the transmission. And it was fun. Bear the front end up a little, that tranny will drain out a little better. Let's see what that cleaning brew did. Well, it's flowing like oil. Obviously water's coming out. That's something good.
has some sludge build up on the bottom still. And it all seems to be coming out pretty easy. Looks reasonably clean up top. Looks like the sludge is off the gears and everything else and all got into the bottom here. Kind of got the used stirring stick and an old sock. Oh yeah, this gets right in there. Look at all that goop coming out. I'm gonna have to clean this whole loader off by the time I'm done here. It's time for a new sock. Four socks later, it's not too bad inside. Now new gaskets are available for this back cover and I bought one. Got it from olivercrawlers.com but I'm looking, the old gasket isn't that bad and I think I need to change that fluid one more time. If I put a new gasket, I'll convince myself it's good enough and never change it. If I reuse the old gasket and it leaks slightly, then I'll get around to putting on the new gasket and I have to change oil again. I had made such a mess that I decided a thorough cleaning was in order. As I'm washing it, probably don't need to wash everything, especially stuff like the battery that I can just take out. In my starter switch, it just comes right off. Now the battery's out, I should probably reroute this negative cable so it doesn't drag in the tracks as much. I should probably deal with this positive cable too. Though it looks like that'll be easier to get off with the hood off. Spray can lid fits perfect. That's handy. There too. It's a lot easier to pull that out now. Now this part of the harness goes up to that dashboard and nothing there works. Let's do a little more cleanup. Well, this didn't work. And this one didn't work either. This whole thing can go. Ooh, handy. I'm gonna hang on to this piece. I got most of the chunks off and pretty much degreased the entire machine. But there's one more step I wanna go in the cleaning process I've got a product that I like. It's convenient. You just spray it on and let it dry. And it comes in gallon cans. It's looking better already. We'll touch it up tomorrow and it should be good. I discovered one thing about painting a machine like this real fast. You can't paint it in one shot. There's no way to get under these loader arms in order to paint them with them down. Also, the tracks. I'm gonna have to rotate them to get the other half of the wheels. There's gonna be spots of yellow here. It's gotta move around, which means I need to get it running again. I already uncovered the engine. Now I'm working on the battery and electrical system. I found an old positive cable in my bin. I'm gonna go ahead and steal this one. It's even got an output for extra power for the dashboard and stuff like that. Now before, the battery cable went on the outside and the sun baked the insulation, it was falling apart. So I want to run this cable under stuff so it gets the least amount of sun possible. And I also have to make sure when these arms move up and down, I don't run into the battery cable. Now these are down pretty far. And you can see the bucket is actually quite a bit below the level of the track. I think if I drill a hole right here in the corner, it'll come around right about here underneath those hydraulic cylinders. When the arms move up and down, it'll still be clear, so I should be okay. There's a lot of metal there. There we go. I also want to run my ground cable inside this box, somewhere in this area. Seeing how much metal I had to go through before, I want to see what's behind this. It's a good thing I looked, because that one's about an inch thick, that one's about a half inch thick. I pretty much have to hit this spot. I'm never gonna hit it from this side. I'm gonna drill from that side. Not convenient at all. At least I should get the bolt where I want it. There we go. Came out right here. That'll work fine. I piloted that hole with a quarter inch. I'm gonna go to a 5 16 That's the size bolt I'm gonna use. Now the hole is made completely. So I'm gonna keep going. And I'm gonna run the drill chuck right into this metal. And the reason I did that is I wanna ground this. I just took off the paint in a nice neat circle all the way around. There's a lot of metal to drill through, so I went about the minimum size I could to fit this terminal through. I'm gonna try this water tubing here. I had it lying in my bin. I'm not even exactly sure what it is, but it looks like it'll protect the wire. So I slid a piece over and that 
just barely fits through this hole. It looks like that'll be pretty decent protection for this wire. Since I have no charging system at all, I'm gonna go with a big deep cycle battery for now. That yeah, looks like it'll fit. I've got a battery hole down in the standard bolts. Normally they're put in this way, but I don't have a whole lot of clearance up, but I got a lot down. So I'm gonna install them this way. And now the J bolts fit perfectly in the top clamp. All set. We just put our wing nuts on the bottom. Now this battery is pretty close to the top of that lid. Found a nice piece of foam. And it's just about the perfect size to cover the entire top of the lid. I can even see daylight to know where to drill my hole. Hole drilled. Now I got an insulation layer. Looks like I gotta straighten this bottom flange a little bit. There, bolts, wing nuts, and we're done. I had drained that fluid concoction. I never put anything in. So before I move this, I want to actually fill it up. Doing pure gear oil this time. It's probably been decades since the machine had that. That water had been there a long time. Got to hook up my electrical system again. Oh. Your filter fell off. Apparently that's not sturdy without a clamp. Uh, maybe I should add a clamp to that. I forgot to mask the rods and the lift cylinders. So now we're going with the rag and acetone. Comes right off while it's still wet. Luckily, I did remember to tape up the tilt cylinders. Well, now rustish blue looks wrong for the air filter. Looking better already. With the hood off, we can see this Nissan diesel a lot better. I'm also noticing some of these lines are wet. That probably needs to be fixed at some point here. That one definitely, it almost seems like the fuel is just oozing through the side of this hose. A new line shouldn't hurt. Good thing I left the drain pan under this thing. I think this is just gravity feeding. There we go. There we go. And it's still leaking. That ends 5 sixteenths, that ends quarter inch. I'm gonna try to go to the smaller one. Good thing rubber is stretchy. There we go. Yep, that's gonna go. Also, good thing it's coated with diesel fuel. That lubricates it nice. I noticed this fuel line sticks out past the side of the engine. And then I noticed it's on a banjo fitting. So I think I can just pop that loose, rotate it. Now it doesn't stick out anymore. Because I know that arm is pretty close. Now there's some bolts missing where the tracks attached to the frame. I figure those might be important. A little tricky to get to though. Now this thing has good ground clearance. That is awfully close to the engine there. And it'll probably hit if the engine moves at all. I can't even come close to getting it in this way. At least not with this length bolt. I'm gonna make some custom length bolts here. Even with one of my shortened bolts, I can't get that way. Let's see if I can get the other way. Going with the long needle nose pliers to install a lock washer. All right, lock washer is on. Let's see if I can do the same trick with the nut. I can definitely see why these weren't installed before. There we go. We got a bolt installed. Some of these grease fittings, you only can get to them with the arms up. A lot of these haven't been done in years. You can tell they don't flow well, at least at first. Sometimes it helps to just pressurize them and let them just sort of push its way in. Give it a few minutes, it might work. There's one last fluid in this, and that's the engine oil. So let's change that too. I got the engine warm, so I think this is coming straight at me. Yep, that just looks like oil. Just regular old black oil. Kind of a relief to see something without water in it. 
Oh, there's two drain plugs. Of course. Why would there just be one drain plug? Oh. Second drain plug looks okay. Now, while this drains, I gotta figure out how much oil this thing takes. Now, I've been bothered by the fact that the loader arms hit this filter. It seems like that could turn bad someday. So I wanted to see if that was the only filter I could fit on here. When I looked up this engine, I found out there were two different filters that came in this truck. There's that one, and a skinnier version. The thread looks the same, the gasket diameter looks the same, just this one's a smaller diameter body. So that might be perfect. Hopefully that problem's solved. Fresh oil is going in. No leaks. Oil's topped off, so now the hood can go back on. Now one of my least favorite things to do is to replace parts that are still working. It just feels so wrong. But in the cases of something like this hydraulic hose, where it's still working, but when I put a load on it, it could explode in my face, I might make an exception. I bought a big pile of hoses. Lots of hoses. Now hydraulic hoses can get really crazy expensive. But these came from the surplus center, which is the best prices I've found yet. They weren't too crazy. I got sizes ranging from two feet, which were pretty cheap, to six feet long, which wasn't that uncheap. Now I just gotta put them all in. Luckily, I remembered to lower the bucket before I popped these hoses open. Now these bottom ones have been really tough. Now I'm gonna use the squeezing the pliers to turn the wrench trick, and hopefully I can crack this one loose. I think it moved. One nice thing about tapered threads is they get easier as you go. Now it's really moving. <sighs> well, that went badly. A lot of those fittings didn't want to come off. I ended up bending one of the pieces of pipe trying to turn it. There are torch marks. Some of the hoses need a little sawzall persuasion. Might have hit that with the sawzall just a little bit, but all new hoses are in there. We're just gonna erase all the issues we just had. There, like it never occurred. Probably should wipe off the hydraulic oil, but oh well. Perfect. Came out the next morning to see how it all looked. Got all the new hoses on the top side. My daughter helped me with thread sealant, so I know they're not gonna leak. There's a couple way down below that I didn't replace, but they didn't get sun on them and they looked okay. And they won't spray me with oil if they go. That line that used to drag on the tracks is now clamped up and out of the way. I've got a few puddles of stray oil here and there to mop up. I'm just gonna do a quick cleanup, charge the battery, and then we're gonna give this thing a try. I figured I'd use third gear for traveling. is a job that can best be described as a good excuse. I have some old tires buried in the ground from an old obstacle course for my kids, and I have a tiny stump. These could probably both be removed with a shovel in about five minutes. I think it would be a lot more fun to use a three-ton crawler loader to scoop these out of the ground.
I think I might have buried a GoPro. Oops. Got it. A bunch of things became immediately apparent. First off, I have no idea how to use this machine. I can't tell where the bucket is. I bet a lot of you are yelling at your screen, no, tilt up, tilt down. I had no idea what I was doing. Secondly, that lift on the back is weight that it needs. It is real light in the back. It felt real tippy. I was glad that I could keep the bucket kind of low, and if it's tipped, I could hit the bucket on the ground. But most importantly, it works. I can dig with this. I need more work to do with it. I wonder if we need an in-ground swimming pool here somewhere. Between the hoses and the oil and the filters and the paint, I've sunk several hundred dollars into this. But I figured it was worth it because this thing can do some work. So now I've got a machine I can hop in, drive around, dig dirt, do whatever I need to do. It's ready to go. There are a few luxury items I want to add later, like a charging system and gauges and a starter switch that doesn't involve alligator clips and minor stuff like that. I'll get to those luxury items later, but for now, I've got to get on to some of those other projects, which will also be fun. I hope you guys are having fun too, and we'll see you next time.